The idea of serving the greater good conjures up images of soup kitchens, homeless shelters, or maybe volunteers working in the third world with the implication of hardship duty and that service is painful sacrifice. Why do we suppose that giving means losing? It doesn't. Service is more simply the making of choices. In this story, you're going to meet a group of people who have chosen to commit their lives to a deeper understanding of the planet. They are the scientists and support staff of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. HUI, as it is called here on Cape Cod, is an independent, nonprofit organization that was founded in 1930 to conduct oceanographic research. But this is not a science lesson. This is a story about what it feels like to learn what was once unknowable, to see life forms that have never been seen before, and ultimately to think a thought that has never been thought before. search of the answers look for God in life on distant planets have your faith in the ever after while well, each of us holds inside the map to the labyrinth and heaven's here on earth in this the international year of the oceans we commit two half hour episodes to exploring what makes Hui unique in part one, you will discover what it is like to live and work in a community where entrepreneur scientists raise their own funding in exchange for a level of freedom that fosters a spirit of discovery. But also, you will find a place where mechanics, engineers, and support staff work as equals on scientific teams that could change our world. This is uh, the village area, which is downtown Woods Hole, uh, the small fishing village, which uh, we have a good, you know, majority of buildings. A lot of them are um, older homes. People have donated to us that we've uh, converted into office space. And they come across the exhibit center on the left. The, you know, the village of Woods Hole being an old fishing village, I think the oceanographic, uh, doing ocean research, I think fits in quite nicely. Uh, without the support crew, you can't get your science done. And a great example of that is Bob Gagosian, our director. Um, you know, he's, he's treated us, you know, as if we were as important as a scientist. This institution attracts a number of interesting people. Uh, if you ask me for a personnel profile on them, uh, I would give you the following generalization. Uh, they're probably only children or the oldest child. Um, they probably have been told no only a couple times in their life and they've ignored it. Well, I came over from, from Germany originally and I worked at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography as a microbiologist. And on the way back, after two years, I was invited to give a lecture here at Woods Hole. And I was very impressed by the informal atmosphere. And I, I talked to the director like I talked to a technician. Ordinary people eating ordinary lives Filled with love, compassion, forgiveness, and sacrifice Heaven's in our hearts I was doing uh, work on plankton for my degree when I was getting my PhD and I, so I applied to come out and be a postdoctoral scholar which is a one-year appointment that you do. Hui is an exciting place to work, one of the few places where you can uh, stay a long time and have a full body of ocean-going research. So 20-some years later my one-year appointment is still going. I came to Hui in 1988 and, and, and when I visited here one day um, I talked to people and I discovered that uh, uh, atmosphere here and the attitude and spirit of people were very, very similar to where I did my postdoc work. And uh, that's where I learned the joy of scientific research. And, and that whole thing was here. And, and that uh, really attracted me. And so I, I found a home, so to speak. I grew up on the New Hampshire shore and my mom studied zoology in the late 1930s. She loved to walk the beach and she loved to spend hours in the afternoon with her children studying tide pools. I came over 20 years ago as a biologist to study the adaptation of animals to different 
features in their habitats. And one of the features that I'm particularly interested in is contaminants in coastal systems. How do organisms thrive or even survive in polluted environments? I, I face a number of, of fairly significant challenges. The, the biggest challenge I face internally is to try to provide an environment where creativity and innovativeness will flourish. That's a difficult thing to do, but it is one that is uh, very important for science to advance. In looking at my own career, I stayed at Woods Hole because that environment was here. We just returned from a two-week cruise on an Icelandic research vessel. We were working around Iceland, as I had been for the last ten years. And the reason we go to Iceland is that the climate record contained in cores such as this is very exciting. Um, as you'll notice that there's this very blackened, dark area down the core. And we know that's a volcanic ash layer. And because the written record of Icelanders is, is so great back a thousand years, we know exactly the time that this eruption took place. So I have an instant datum in this location. It's exciting to me because, for instance, in the last 10 years since I've been going to Iceland, there's been a huge temperature shift to the north of Iceland of, of three and four degrees. They had the coldest winter to the north of Iceland two years ago that they've had since they've been taking data since 1949. That's a huge impact on little creatures like this that live in the water that expect a certain temperature to be able to live and, and to reproduce. What effect does this knowledge have on us as a society? As we understand ocean processes, we, we can better understand how those processes affect the climate system. And that has a real impact. I mean, this last winter, why did we have floods? Um, are there more tornadoes this year? Can we learn how to be better people and live better together and use the ocean wisely? There's a cartoon outside of my office and there's Mother Nature and she has a bag on her back and it says global climate. And in one corner there's tornadoes and storms and she says, what do I have to do to get your attention? Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people's attention that it does matter what we do. We've been interested in what is it that affects the survival of the fish out there. And one of the things that uh, is important to that is when, when the fish that we're interested in catching to eat, when they're first born, they're really tiny and they're very vulnerable to a lot of things that can cause them to die. One of the things that uh, we were really kind of surprised to find out there were some animals uh, called hydroids the hydroids themselves are these this sort of tangle of long stalk-like things. The little feathery tips on them are the tentacles, which is what they use to uh, catch and sting their prey, just like a jellyfish stings things. And the, the little guys that are zipping around in the background here um, are copepods. One of them will run into the tentacles and it'll get stung. They pull the animal into the body and there's something that looks like it got stuck uh, right up there on one of these. And when it does get stung, it gets pulled in and eaten. We don't think of them as being something which is going to affect fish swimming around, baby fish swimming around up in the water. But it turns out on George's Bank, they uh, get stirred up and we find them in the water. Uh, and uh, this is actually is one of these sort of unexpected discoveries. It, it was a, people knew that these animals existed, but they didn't know that they existed where we found them up in the water. And they didn't know they were doing the things that we found them doing. And so it turned out that we, quite unexpectedly find this huge and very significant source of mortality from baby fish from an unexpected quarter. And so now they're the focus of an awful lot of effort to determine just how significant these animals are and what kind of effect they do have on, on fish survival. Look around, believe in what you see. Kingdom is at hand, promised land is at your feet. We're down the village of Woods Hole, we're uh, entering the dock area, which is over by the port office behind the Smith building, and uh, it's pretty much the, the hub of activity on the waterfront. Uh, the Oceanus is at dock right now, unloading previous uh, science samples and gear, and uh, reloading to go back out again. We are the spirit, the collective conscience. In 1969, I read an advertisement for, they were looking for a machinist. So I answered the ad, and I figured I'd come down here for a year. And here it is, it'd be 28 years 
what kept me here all these years was, was the fact that uh, you feel as though you contribute something back to society and you don't just get a paycheck. When you work here, you get, you're part of the organization. That's how they treat you. And the, uh, I don't think you can find that very many places. This, this is really a great example of uh, what we've been talking about or what makes this place special. One of our scientists, Fred Sales, had an idea of how to extract water out of the sediments, out of the mud at the bottom of the ocean in very fine layers. But he's not an engineer and he's not a machinist. The scientists have the ideas. They conceive the ideas and we just refine them and everything and make, put them into real life and make items work. Charlie sits there and thinks about how to solve problems. So Fred went in and said, Charlie, I want to collect mud from the bottom of the ocean. I want to collect the water in millimeter levels, and I don't want it to mix. How do I do it? In real life, you know, you're given the test first and then the answers afterwards. So you have to be pretty good at guessing what something's going to, how it's going to respond. You never know what you're going to do. Um, any big job is just a, a whole bunch of little ones. So. There's nothing to ever be afraid of. You just start out where you know and just continue. All the technicians and everybody, all the engineers and everybody, we all contribute and we feel good about it. So we all have our own personalities, but I think, like in every family, it's the same way. You have everybody has a different personality, but you wouldn't trade them. <laughs> I just lost a good colleague. Uh, I work with him up here for him. Yeah, quite a few years. Yeah. Then he, he moved over to ocean engineering. And it was, he was a good friend. He used to argue like crazy, but everybody argued with Woody. So. I just stopped up just to say hello. I just told him how enjoyable it was working with him for all these years. Then he died. Pulled into the Quissa campus. Uh, this houses Clark Laboratory, Phi Laboratory, McLean Laboratory. So this is the Fennel House. Um, it's an old mansion. Uh, now it houses the uh, director's office and the development office. Also on the lower level is the buttery, which we, uh, a lot of the employees eat their lunch there. You know, the scientific staff really like it because they get to intermingle with each other and talk about you know, the different projects they're all working on. I started the buttery uh, 24 years ago. I mean, it's doing what I wanted it to do, which was foster communication and, and provide a nice home cooked meal. And uh, when they get over here, they may sit and talk with somebody they've been wanting to talk to for weeks, but haven't had the time. And then you'll hear this exchange going on, and you'll say, oh, wow, they're really, this is something they've been meaning and needing to do. That's one thing that happens for sure. And um, the scientists are having a harder and harder time um, getting funding, and so the stress is, is increasing. And I think the importance of this place increases also. It's a soft money institute. We don't have a salary. We have to get the salary ourselves through grants. And people that think they can do it are certain people that accumulate here. If someone can't do it or if doesn't like the pressure, if it is pressure to him, then he won't be here. I describe it as an autonomous collective where uh, everybody who's here has their own thing that they want to do. And in a sense, everybody here is an entrepreneur of science for themselves. And they can pursue their particular scientific interests as far as their abilities, which includes their ability to get funding, will take them. Yes, the funding competition is severe. Um, the, the stresses that go along with that create a lot of tension. But the intellectual process in writing a proposal, putting together ideas, putting together research teams is very exciting. So you have a certain group around you that are like yourself and uh, you take the risk, uh, you pay for your freedom. 
by being constantly a little bit uneasy, will I be paid next year? Will I get a grant or not? The conditions we have here may, may sound uh, a little bit harsh because of the soft money situation. But uh, what we have is freedom, and, and freedom to grow, and, and, and you are in charge of whatever you, you want to do. That is, I make my own plans. I'll uh, carry them out myself. And that's one part that I really like about the soft money environment. I like the independence of the soft money environment. Everybody works based on the ideas that bubble up within themselves or that they develop from their colleagues. And the good ideas get more and more exciting and they sort of rise up and more people get involved and excited. In a sense, it's a tremendous stimulant uh, because you, you, you have to compete with other people and, and uh, prove what you are thinking is doable and, and it's a good thing to do. It's, it's an academic freedom sort of taken to an extreme where everybody can do their own thing as long as they can make other people understand what the importance of that thing is. One of the most common features of scientists is a, a willingness to discover. I love seeing a new student come into the graduate program, make their first major discovery. The sense of discovery was a big attraction for me to come into science. Um, as a child, I remember being very interested in science and um, everything seemed new and interesting. But um, then by the time I got to grammar school or high school, um, it seemed like all the scientists we'd read about lived in the 1800s or prior to World War II. Um, and it really didn't seem like there was much science left to be done. It wasn't until I got to college that I realized that there is really interesting science still being done and that I could really make an impact and discover new things. I think Hui is a great place to come for anybody, any high school student or college student who just likes fundamentally to ask questions. And I think one of the things that um, unites kids who are interested in science is the, a curiosity of how things work and how things fit together. You really see that with children, especially talking about some of these deep sea animals, because that's a real good case of going down in a submarine, which is an exciting way to do anything, and finding things down there and living in the ocean that nobody has ever seen. And I think they really respond to that. They're, they're very interested in the creatures when they see the pictures of animals they never th knew existed, both that they're really beautiful or that they're really strange or that they have enormous teeth or something of that nature. Uh, it, it excites them. For kids who are interested in science, for kids who are interested, just curious about the world around them, that oceanography is a place you can take it where you are putting together puzzles that people either haven't thought of or you're finding a new piece that explains the whole thing, the whole thing falls into place. You know, I probably had very little interest in science, especially going through school and everything, and uh, once you get involved, it becomes more than a job, it becomes part of your life. Um, a good, great example is even my kids, uh, you know, because of working here, uh, my kids are more involved with science at school and, uh, you know, the science teacher finds out that they're, they're one of their students' parents work here, uh, they feel more connected. I gave a talk once in my career to some kids at a science fair up in Boston and my youngest son was sitting in the audience and uh, I finished my talk, it was about how I got involved in, in oceanography and his hand went up for the first question. And of course, this is your greatest fear. There are 500 kids in this, in this audience, and there's my son. And I said, uh, yes, Alex. And he said, Daddy, they pay you to do this? Personal nature of it, that these scientists aren't quite the stereotypes that people might think, that they're all different kinds of people, and they all really get excited about you know, cool new things whether it's a mathematical formula or a, a piece of rock that they dredged up from the bottom of the ocean. I think that the most important thing uh, for doing earth sciences, ocean sciences, or, or environmental sciences is to understand how the earth works. So I study uh, not oceans, but, but rocks that, that uh, make up the ocean floor. When people were talking about the sense of discovery, I don't know that as a chemist I'll actually be able to go out and see something that nobody else has seen before chemically. But what I'll be able to do is explain how different things work and put different pieces of a puzzle together. And I think that's really, really important. In very simple terms, uh, each rock contains clocks and thermometers and, and barometers and, and other uh, things which we call natural tracers. Here you are looking at source rocks 
of, of oceanic crust, a new crust. And so, so that by, by measuring the time, and, and you, you get to know when they formed. And, and uh, by looking at the, the traces, you, you know how they formed. And, and determining uh, the pressures and temperatures uh, uh, buried in them, you know where they came from. And, and on the other hand, this, this piece, for example, this is a picture of diamond and, and garnet in, the, in it. This is believed to be very old, like 3.2 billion years old. And so the chemical composition and the tracer compositions buried in it tells me a great deal about the entire history of the Earth. And I respect for what is earthly And I earn faltering belief In peace and love and understanding If I had all the money in the world, I would endow a program that would take kids, high school, college, and take them out to sea. One week, two weeks, it wouldn't matter. I think it's a great idea for all the graduate students when they first come to Woods Hole to go out together because you're going to go your different ways in your different fields over the next four, five, whatever years it takes um, for your graduation and so you get to know each other in a very special way. Actually about a year ago I had a chance to go to the uh, middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, about the latitude of Miami. Um, we spent about 37 days there studying uh, spreading processes and it was just a fantastic experience. How are you? Good, Bob Gagosian, yeah. nice to see you. Well, I think that the sense of adventure is, um, I think that's a big part, or at least for me it was. Before I entered graduate school, um, I had never even been out of the country, um, so this represented a great opportunity to get around and travel and kind of see the world. Oh, no. <laughs> so, you all excited? Yeah. Ready to go? Jim, I haven't met you. Uh, nice to You're meet Jim, you. is that right? Jim, yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I don't know if all of you know the, the origins of this, but, but there was a strong feeling a number of years ago that if you were going to be involved in studying the sea, we wanted to get you out there as soon as possible. It presents the origins of the institution, because the original Atlantis uh, was a ship like this, and routinely scientists from Woods Hole over many, many years went out on that ship. Uh, as a matter of fact, that ship traveled 600,000 miles which is really quite extraordinary. You know? I don't want to tell you that you're going to, you're going to go 600,000 miles on, on this ship. So on all your cruises that you've gone on, have you ever gotten a chance to go down on the Alvin? Yeah, I was fortunate uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s. I had a number of cruises uh, mm -hmm. in the Gulf of California. We were interested in the hydrothermal vents. And that was actually on a, on a dive with Holger Janisch. And, and uh, Holger and I were on a, on a trip together on that expedition. And we, we just talked about it for hours into the night and worked into the night. What are these species? Well, it was amazing. Hydrothermal vents were discovered completely unexpectedly. It was the amazing idea that uh, life could grow to such high dimensions in the absence of light. It's, it's an amazing uh, new aspect. You fly over the barren desert, you see mud, rocks sticking out, and then the pilot tells you he is coming closer to the rift area. And then suddenly you go over an edge and look into a valley that is densely populated by all sorts of structures that you have never seen before, especially the tube worms. And they are bright white in the lights of Alvin, of course, the submersible lights. And the gills sticking out are bright red. This is hemoglobin, by the way. And this phenomenon of the deep sea oases is um, possible because of certain types of bacteria that are doing the same thing as green plants do, but they are using as a source of energy the oxidation of an inorganic compound. So they can do without light what green plants do with light. These bacteria were well known, but that these bacteria were able to run these dense population of animals, that was completely unknown and unexpected. I think it is sort of possibly biologically the biggest discovery of the second half of this century. the beginning of, of your voyage into a, what, what I've got to tell you is an extraordinary life. I mean, I think you're going to have one heck of a lot of fun 
over the next several years. Uh, oceanography is, is really a wonderful field because it's exciting, you're learning things, you're, yeah. you're discovering things, and, you're, and you, get, you go out there. I've been places where I question all I think I know. I believe, I believe. The unique culture that has grown in and around the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is a byproduct of the sea. Ingrained in everyone who works on shore is the realization that at any given moment scores of their colleagues and neighbors are far from home. Join us next time as the Oceanus tries to outrun a hurricane to test the tripod invented by Fred Sales and Charlie Peters. And the famed submersible Alvin is launched for the first time off of the newly commissioned research vessel Atlantis.